welcome into today's edition of Last Call, but different show, still loaded. We've got all the stuff to talk about. Jake's not here yet. He'll join us in a bit. But first, we're going to have a conversation about UND sports, men's basketball, women's basketball over the weekend, and just all sports in general. We brought in Jacob Walton, who works in the UND sports information department. He's going to join us for a conversation about all UND sports. Jacob, how are you doing today? Good, good. Happy to be here. This has been a long time coming. Excited to get talking UND sports, repping the brand however I can. So. It's going to be a fun opportunity, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, just talk UND sports in general. So you went to Quincy over the weekend to watch both men and women's basketball games. But first, just tell me about how, tell me about your role in the sports information department. So I'm a graduate assistant for sports information, so I'm currently the uh, primary contact for women's soccer, baseball, wrestling, and tennis. Um, and I help alongside with Brady with his sports and everything. It's kind of a team effort, but we have our primary contact sports in which we wrap the recaps for and do all the fun stuff regarding that. Um, but besides taking pictures and doing the stuff I've been doing, but just writing recaps, updating record books, all the fun stuff, basically. So men and women's basketball, that's not your primary sport, but you went with radio over the weekend. You called it as a color analyst. Let's start with women's basketball. How'd the game go? Obviously, the women get the win. They're now 3-1 and one on the year. Just tell me about your experience at Quincy. Got to give the team credit. Um, they did a great job, and you got to got to look at it from the two top scorers. Sadie Hill has been consistent in these last three games, and I talked with M Mark Mitchell about last week what he needs out of Sadie. I think Mark and her had a bit of a conversation of the expectations for her as a captain, as a senior, and as the offensive presence on this team that – she needed to be Sadie Hill. If that team's going to win, she has to be Sadie Hill. And they did a really good job of that game, of facilitating through her. Early in the game, they kind of showed that that was their card, trying to get her in the post. As much as, as Quincy did the same, they, the game was going to be a post battle. But what nobody, nobody could have expected is the second half. Somebody that hadn't touched the floor in the first half, Caselyn Krebs, comes in just on fire. And girl lights it up from three. Uh, Lena Wells takes not one, not two, but three hits to the head in the game. Gets elbowed early on. And if you look at the look at the the format of the arena, they have these box like these box seats right underneath the basket. Not a lot of room for players to land. She slams her head into one of those seats later in that second quarter. So Elena Wells pretty much was out of that game. Caitlin Krebs comes in, sees an opportunity, and takes it, and was confident and lights out from three point land. Score 16 in the second half of well, and basically willing the Greyhounds to a win in that game. And it's just interesting to see how this team's going to continue to grow, but that's a really big statement win, especially in a close game. It's their second game in a row, winning by three. So this team has handled that pressure very well. So they open conference play with that win. They move on to three and two on the year. They'll play again on Thursday night, and then on Saturday we'll have both those games right here on UND TV for you. As far as the men's team, they also play on Thursday and Saturday coming up, so we'll have both those games as well. They were not quite as successful at the end of the game against Quincy. Obviously, you were at the game, you called it as well, same as the women's game. Walk me through how the men's game went. Obviously, they lost, so they, it was the first loss of the season. They're 4-1 and one now. 62-57 was that score. How'd that game go? I'm going to um, I'm gonna quote our, our wonderful head coach, Paul Corsaro. Not well. And I know he didn't exactly say that, but that game was the worst game that this team has played this season. There were some bright spots, and it was nice to see Josiah Tynes. I... If you know me, you know how much I can rant about how much of a weapon Josiah Tynes can be when he's hot. And he struggled early on this season. I think in their first four games, he didn't score above eight points. He had 15 this game. He had 15 in this game. And a couple big three-point plays that really, really kept the grounds in this game, especially when players like Jacoby Robinson and Sean Craig are going cold from three-point land. And one of the things in credit Cody Wainscott, he saw the stat in the recap that – they shot almost, I think, 50% of their shots from three-point land. They were consistently trying to take that shot when it just wasn't there. And they were forcing plays. But got to give credit to the Quincy Hawks post players. They were not giving Kendrick Choa, they were not giving um, David Eja any opportunities in the paint at all. They, they were really stifling them however they could. And I remember it was probably early in the, the first half, I, um, Paul yelled, we're going to attack them in the paint, and it just it didn't work out for them. The, the, the calls really didn't go their way. There was a, it was a chippy in contact full game, but the, the calls didn't end up really going their way throughout the contest, and it was just poor, poor decision-making when it comes to turnovers, 
and when it comes to some other mistakes that they made throughout the contest. Looking at their first four games, it was really the bench that came up and played very well for them, right? 100%. So they came in, a spark off the bench, and typically outscored the starting lineup. That wasn't quite the case this game. What was kind of the difference here? Why weren't the bench players like you mentioned, Ija, Bruno Williams as well, Sean Craig missed a couple three-point shots. Why weren't they able to get going? It, it's just a momentum thing for a lot of those guys. Sean Craig has been, me and Cody Wayne's got to talk about him a lot, our assistant SID. Sean Craig is the real deal, and he just struggled. And you, you see he takes some shots there that, man, you might be forcing it there. And it's a hard decision-making thing. And then uh, Bruno Williams, the Lewis transfer, struggled mightily fouls-wise, turnovers-wise. It seemed like there were some bunnies, as, as Graham Shear would say, that they just kind of didn't capitalize on, didn't get the easy points. And, and that's the momentum that you need on the bench. And when your bench isn't performing, that forces Paul Corsar's hand into putting back in Josiah Tynes, putting back in Ben Nickerson, putting back in Jesse Bingham, all three of those guys have high motors, but there's only so high that motor can go. So a lot of the guys were tired because their bench wasn't performing, and Corsaro can't let that game get more out of hand than he did. So um, it, it was a situation where some poor performance on the offensive end just resulted in more fatigue, more tiredness, and overall just not a, a, a good team effort overall. Let's switch gears and talk about UND's men's tennis team really making waves in the nation. The, talk about nation. Uh, Tom Zuch and Edgar Testua, number one ranked team in the country, winning the fall championships. Couldn't be happier for those two guys who Tom battled injuries all throughout last season and coming out, and they looked impressive as impressive can be. We ended up hosting the Midwest Regional here, and they, they ran the bracket pretty convincingly, and it was an instant just click, and they play well together, they communicate, and sort of they're able to play the, the finesse versus power and sort of play back, play off each other incredibly well. It's going to be really interesting to see what this men's team does, especially as we're nearing the season. Their, their season's coming up relatively soon, so it's going to be interesting. And I know we're talking about the men's team, but the women's team equally is as good. Obviously, they didn't have the success, nas success nationally that Tom and Edgar did, but uh, Anna Novakova continues to be one of the best players in this country. Singles, doubles, she has the history in doubles, playing with Nicole Alexeva for those years being that number one team. She knows what it's like to be the number one doubles team of the country, and she ends up winning the, the Midwest region with Sofia Sharanova in pretty convincing fashion. They didn't really go their way at the national tournament, but they, they made a really good showing. And then someone that I think has the, the ability similar to Edgar is Leah Karachevic in singles. She made, a, she made a run in the Midwest region, getting the finals of that losing a close three-set battle, but she has a, a really good opportunity to submit herself as a top-ranked player in the country. You can catch this entire conversation on YouTube if you're watching on Last Call. Just snippets of it are on the show, but you can watch the entire thing on YouTube with UNE TV. More next here on Last Call. Award-winning news coverage. Brought to you by ethical journalists that care about you. We have you covered on crime, latest on sports, and the best in entertainment. This is UND TV News. Back here on Last Call, a big thanks to Jacob Walton. For that interview, you can catch the entire thing on our YouTube channel, Unity TV. That was just a few snippets. We also talk about men and women's soccer and wrestling, some more Unity sports there in the conversation. So catch the entire conversation on YouTube. But for the rest of the show today, Nathaniel Finch here with Jake Kiefer. Let's start in the college realm, college football. Purdue, NIU played. Purdue got the win, baby. Yeah, you know, congrats to the Boilers on their Oakland Bucket win. It was well-deserved. IU played horrible the entire game. Of course, Dexter Williams went out late in the third quarter. Uh, of course, he's the redshirt freshman quarterback that took over for Connor Bazelak after he got benched. Just didn't really work out for the Hoosiers. It was a tough injury, too. It was hard to watch, and you know, you hope he's well. But you know, for Purdue, a slow start, and then they really did a good job kicking it into gear from there. Got that big win, 30-16, to and not only that, but with Iowa's loss on Friday gave them the Big Ten West uh, title, so they're heading to the Big Ten Championship for the first time ever 
Granted, the championship's only been around for 12 or 13 years, but the first time Purdue will be in it. They'll be playing in Indy next week, and excited to see how bad they lose to Michigan. And you got to think the Big Ten's excited about it because of all those ticket sales, of all those uh, Buller fans showing up for the game. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you've got to imagine plenty of people from Ann Arbor and Columbus bought their tickets beforehand thinking their team was going to win. Obviously, Michigan got the win against Ohio State. We'll talk about that one here in a bit, but... It is, it is going to be exciting here that Purdue gets to go and play in that title game. Be interesting Final to see how it goes. Final score of that one, 30-16. to 16. Again, congrats to your Boilers, my man. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was kind of expected going in they'd win the game. However, I was a little worried knowing that you had the title on the line. If you win, you win the Big Ten West. Figured the Boilers would do something and mess it up. But well, it's a rivalry end, game. You yeah. know, it, it, anything's possible in a rivalry game. Just like anything's possible for IU to lose a game. <laughs> so, you know, they were up at halftime. I was very confident. Then they just blew up in their face. Let's move on to our next game. That is Notre Dame versus USC. Came in with a really highly regarded matchup. We thought that it'd be a you know, highly anticipated game. USC, with all their recent success, they were ranked six going into the game. Notre Dame, a top 15 team as well. But, you know, when it came down to it, it was USC who got a nice win, 38-27. to and the Caleb Williams Heisman campaign strengthens. He had three touchdowns on the ground. He had one in the air. He looked in control the entire game. You see right there the pocket collapses. The escape ability that he has and, and the ability to throw on the run and find the open receiver down the field, it's just electric to watch Caleb Williams operate. Drew Pine didn't look too bad either for Notre Dame. He ended with over 300 yards and three touchdowns. It just wasn't, it wasn't one of those games we're accustomed to seeing from Notre Dame where they just pound the rock and they run the ball and they have multiple 100-yard rushers. You know, they, just, they had to play to USC style. They had to come from behind, and you know, it just didn't work too well for them. Yeah, and I think most of that is USC setting the tone. You know, they look good through the air, but they got a lot done on the ground, which really kind of ran the clock down and forced Notre Dame into some tough situations where they had to pass the ball a lot. It's going to make things interesting now for USC. They go into now a Pac-12 title game. And they were ranked six going in there. you got to imagine they're going to vault up the rankings once we see what the college football numbers are. It's going to be interesting to see what USC does in the playoffs. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. And, I, I mean, you got to imagine they're going to be in the top four of that playoffs, right? I would think, especially with Ohio State losing to Michigan, Ohio State's probably going to drop out of the top four. But Ohio State know. lost to Michigan? Let's take a look at that game. Michigan went to Columbus, played at the shoe, and you know, they ran Ohio State out of their own building. That was a great win for Michigan. And that moves up to number two in the AP poll. But again, we'll wait and see what the college football, the real poll means. 50, 45 to 23 was the final score here. And, you know, it started with Ohio State had that lead, and then Michigan just took off. Plenty of big plays from this man right here. Yeah, you know, uh, Donovan Edwards uh, out of the backfield there kind of came out of nowhere. Everybody's talking about Blake Corum for Heisman, Blake Corum this, Blake Corum that. Well, the sophomore wanted to make himself known. He finished that game just over 200 yards and a touchdown at a running back for the Wolverines. He looked very good. So did J.J. McCarthy. I think the Wolverines overall looked amazing in this game. Yeah, it was pretty impressive to see Ohio State, obviously, here was ranked two going in. Michigan ranked three. Probably the most anticipated matchup of the year. And it was just Michigan who ran away with it. And it kind of puts a damper on Ohio State's chances to make the playoffs now because it wasn't like it was a close game where you lose by a field goal, you put everything in, you know that, you know, Ohio State, even though they lost, you think that it'd still be a close matchup, but they kind of got blown out towards the end. That's really going to make it hard for them to hang around that top four. They're probably going to have to slip down to five, maybe six, and it's going to make things a lot harder for them to get in the playoffs. And I mean, if they don't make the playoffs, I don't think C.J. Stroud plays. I don't think he plays, and I don't think he wins the Heisman after this loss. I mean, threw a couple uh, red zone interceptions, or one red zone interception, and had a fumble. I mean, he just didn't look like himself out there. That's for sure. So Georgia's still going to get number one. you got to imagine Michigan's going to be number two. TCU, they're probably going to make a playoff, man. They're right up there. They're undefeated. I mean, TCU, granted the Big 12 may not be the powerhouse conference that it once was known to be, but Max Duggan, man, he, he's something to watch back there. He's, he's a lot of fun. Let's move on and take a look at some college basketball. A big weekend for Purdue sports, not only on the football field, but how about this? Beating two top 10 ranked teams. They started the week ranked 24th, but hey, wins against West Virginia, Gonzaga, and now Duke here. They're ranked number five, baby. That'll do it, man. Vaulting up the AP pool. Man, Zach Eady, he's fantastic to watch. If, they can, if the Boilers can keep him on the floor for 30 minutes a game like they have been pacing him out to do, 
It's going to be a tough time trying to beat the Boilermakers, man. And these weren't just like close games that went down to the wire. I mean, Purdue blew out number six ranked Gonzaga, 84 66, number eighth ranked Duke, 75 56. These were big wins. They started the year unranked, only received votes at the beginning of the year, but suddenly, man, ranked fifth, and they're putting up statement wins. And watching those games, man, uh, they really move the ball very well as an offense. A lot of inside, outside action, and Edie passes well to the post. Sets up all the other guys like Fletcher Lawyer, Mason Gillis to get some open threes. Let's move on to our next game. This one, pretty impressive. How about UNC quadruple overtime against Alabama? I said that. Four overtime periods. That's two basketball games that they played in one straight lineup. That was a very impressive game and an impressive win for Alabama. They move up the pole. They were ranked 18th going in, won 70 to 65. And convincing. Or rather, my apologies. 103, 101. UNC also fell to Iowa State 70 to 65. So two losses. Down goes number one. They drop all the way down to 18th in the AP poll. But Alabama, just an impressive win. Yeah, Alabama deserves to vault up that AP poll as well. They, they that was a very convincing win where every time they looked like they were down and out, they'd come back, they'd get a turnover, they'd capitalize on the turnover with some points. It's a good Alabama squad. Looking forward to seeing what they'll do. It gets tough once you get in overtime, your second overtime, third and fourth overtimes. Guys with foul trouble, guys get very tired and fatigued. I mean, it's if you're only allowed five fouls, it's hard to do so once you get to that four mark in the second half and suddenly, oh, you got to play four more overtimes and mess with foul trouble. It makes things pretty hard. I mean, the crazy part about this loss is Armando, ba Armando Baycott and Caleb Love both looked very good offensively. Baycott finishes with a double-double. Love with 31 points. Yeah. They just didn't have enough defense there to propel them over Alabama. Yeah, it was wild. And kudos to Alabama for that win. Roy Williams watching there uh, at the end of the fourth overtime. But, man, it was just it was crazy to see UNC lose like that, two straight loses. You don't want to be number one in basketball. Now, that's not to mention UNC will be number 18 coming in to Assembly Hall on Wednesday. Let's take a look at some IU highlights while we talk about how the Hoosiers, they're undefeated on the year. They're ranked 10th now, so they move up a couple spots. They're going to be playing, like you said, what was the number one team in the nation. Now, obviously, still top 20, a good squad, but it'll be interesting to see how that game goes. Yeah, they've looked good, but not great yet this year. I'm not sold on this IU team yet. They're deep on the bench. They have the pieces there to compete. As you see here, they travel to Xavier. It's a very good Xavier team and a tough place to go into and win, but they got the win. Now, the rest of their wins have come against the Jackson States of the world, and that's nothing against Jackson State as a program. I'm sure they're doing great things in their conference and the SWAC, but it's just not the caliber of opponent that IU's going to see coming up. They've got UNC. They've got Kansas. I mean, they've, and then they open up Big Ten play. There's six Big Ten teams ranked in the top yeah. 25 right now. It's going to be a tough road for the Hoosiers. Yeah, so it's been kind of a... Uh... They're undefeated, obviously, but they're not that top, top, top-ranked team just because we haven't seen them play. This UNC game, I mean, this could definitely help them propel their case to move up, especially against Kansas. And like you said, Big Ten play. If this team can get through with the majority of wins in the Big Ten, they've got a shot to be one of those top teams once tournament time comes around. UNC IU at Assembly Hall on Wednesday. Don't miss it. It'll be a good game. Let's move on when we come back. Some NFL. That's next here on Last Call. Eighty-eight seven, the Diamond, the only jazz and classical station in Indianapolis, completely led by the students of the University of Indianapolis. Listen to us on iHeartRadio, TuneIn app, FM radio, HD radios, or even on our website at wicronline.org. A different kind of public radio. An incredible weekend in the National Football League. It was such a fun week. Colts didn't play. They'll play tonight. We'll preview that game in a bit. They host the Steelers. But as far as just around the rest of the NFL, we had great games on Thanksgiving. One of the first times in a while that all three Thanksgiving games were within you know, a, a touchdown of each other. But then yesterday, some great games. Let's get to the first one. First one wasn't quite the best, but the Dolphins really coming in, looking like one of the better teams in the league. I mean, they came out and were firing against Houston, went up with a big lead. Then Houston came firing back, but Kyle Allen came in. And you see him making a few throws there as Davis Mills got benched. And it was just, it was the defense coming in, making great plays. The offense coming in, doing good. 
It was an all-around great win. Now we're moving on to Cincinnati, or pardon me, to Music City. Cincinnati taking on the Titans. Man, how about Derrick Henry? He's a lot of fun to watch, but look right here. He's going to get it all the way to the goal line, and it's stripped, but the rookie, Traylon Burke from Arkansas, falls on in the end zone, that's a touchdown for Tennessee. Tennessee started with that lead, then the Bengals came back. It was kind of a weird game. It was low scoring, kind of what the, what the Titans are accustomed to, but it wasn't a typical Bengals game. However, once they got towards the end, crunch time, T. Higgins with a great touchdown. Bengals get that win. 20 to 16. Without Chase and Mixon. Moving on now, your Broncos, man. The Panthers dethrone the Broncos. I say dethrone lightly because I don't know what kind of throne the Broncos are sitting on. No, it, they look pretty bad. They did end up scoring late, but the final score there, 23-10, wasn't really that competitive of a game. However, another non-competitive game was up in New York. The Jets, 31, Bears, 10. Mike White come out, came from behind a little bit there. You see some adversity early, but Garrett Wilson had two touchdowns. Mike White threw for 3-15 and three. It was crazy. Yeah, it was an excellent game for Mike White. I think he's looking like the new number one quarterback in New York. Yeah, and I mean, you bench Zach Wilson. Everyone thought that, oh, where's the season going to go from there? You're a wild card team, but Mike White comes in. I mean, he looks good. Falcons and Commanders. Commanders win this one 19-13. Taylor Heineke, 5-1 and one since taking the reins for... Carson Wentz. Pretty impressive. And Brian Robinson, a good running back, too. I like to see that they found him, and he's recovered from his injury earlier in the year. But, man, look at this defense making that game ceiling interception. The final score, Commanders 19, Falcons 13, and Mariota kicking himself. How about this? In overtime, who would have thought this game? Everyone thought that it would be the Bucks come in and run the Browns out of town. No, it did not happen. 23-17, that final score in overtime. The first time... Ever that Tom Brady has lost when leading by seven points or more with two minutes to go. He was 218 and 0 before that. Goodness. And look at this catch, David and Joku. Hey. This, this to send them two overtime. That might be number one on the top ten. Who knows? I think Joku's a great uh, tight end out there for the Browns. He's right when you need it to. And here's the, uh, not the walk-off touchdown, but it got him right into Almost. territory to get that Amari Cooper. And then they gave it off to Nick Chubb. Touchdown, and you get the win. Yeah. Bucks are only a half game above the Falcons, though, in there. Your Ravens, not quite what we thought we would see from them. No, it was sir. Hard-fought battle, came down to the end. You see here, nice little chuck from Lamar, but when it came down to it, Jacksonville just ended up getting the win, 28-27 at the two-point conversion. Yeah, Baltimore's third loss this season when leading by multiple scores in the fourth quarter. It's tough. They've got to figure something out in Baltimore. And you see here, this is where the Jags needed to, or they could have just kicked it and gone to overtime, but they were aggressive, and they got that. They got that uh, two-point conversion here. Justin Tucker would have been a record winner. 67 yards, but he can't hit it a little short. Moving on to the Raiders and the Seahawks here. Man, Derek Carr looked good in this one, but you know who looked really good in this one? That man right there, Josh Joshua Jacobs. Jacobs. Ooh. Man, what a game he had. Yeah, 229 yards on 33 carries, two touchdowns, six receptions for 75 yards, 74 yards. He's quietly having a year. Why is nobody talking about it? Yeah, and it's pretty impressive, and I think it's no longer quiet because the game he had here was kind of not his coming out party, but goodness, he was very good. And, you know, Seattle still had a good offense as well. It's just a great game, back and forth, maybe one of the best games. Went to overtime in the final score there, Raiders 40, Seahawks 34. But, man, look at this. Josh Jacobs walks it off, and it's no longer quiet because he was screaming on his way to the end zone here. All kinds of noise being made, man. He is fun to watch. Can't get over it. Moving on to the cards, Chargers. What a game that was. Man, Nathaniel, 25-24 is the final score there, but the Cardinals were up 17-14 going in a half. What happened? This is very similar to your Ravens game, where you know you get down to the end, you can kick the field to go to overtime. Now, Brandon Staley says we're going for it. They get the two-point conversion. It was just a hard-fought battle you see here. They score the touchdown. He gets in, and then here's the two-point attempt to Gerald Everett, and they win that one 25-24. How about this? Niners start up scoring early. They're going to score a bunch of points right now, just 13. They did blank the Saints on defense. You see Kamara helped out the efforts there with that fumble, but 13 to nothing. Kind of an uncharacteristic game for this offense. Two you fumbles see? on the night for Kamara, too. Look at D'Amico Ryan's Niners DC. Happy with that shutout. Then we go to Arrowhead. How about the Chiefs? They get a big win, 26 to 10 over the Rams. Rams without Matt Stafford in this one. Bryce Perkins under center for L.A. He looked like a guy who was getting his first career start, that's for sure. Now we move to Sunday night football. Eagles 40, Packers 33. 
Rogers ended up going down with an injury, but man, it was a great game for most of it. Hard fought battle. The Eagles just squeak out the win. Man, Jalen Hurts over 150 yards, both passing and rushing. Miles Sanders over 140 with two touchdowns. You see here, this this is when Rodgers went out. Love came in, threw a touchdown himself. Rodgers with that oblique injury. Jake, we may never see Aaron Rodgers again. Well, how can that be? He's going to be the Colts starting quarterback <laughs> next year. There's a chance, and I don't know, we'll see. But right now, the Packers being the record that they have, not quite a flattering record for them. Let's say they're out of playoff contention in a week or two. Rodgers says, let's shut it down for the season. He says he's going to play as long as they're mathematically in it, but if they're not in it, I don't know if we're going to see him out there. Let Jordan yeah. Love. I think the Packers would rather see Jordan Love, see what they get out of him. And then does Rodgers retire at the end of the year? I mean, we may have seen the last of Aaron Rodgers. It's kind of a sad thought. It's the changing of the guards at the quarterback position now. You know, no, Brady's probably done in the next year or two. You, know, you got Rodgers done in the next year or two. Now it's up to Pat Mahomes to carry on the legacy. How about Matt Ryan? Let's take a look at him and see uh, how you think the Colts are going to do tonight against the Steelers. Well, it's the Steelers. So, you know, they're struggling this year. They've got Kenny Pickett as their quarterback right now. Not looked the best, but also not looked horrible. So, you know, your spread is two and a half. The Colts are favored. I'm probably going to probably going to go with the spread for sure. I think I agree. I'm going to go with the public here because 68% of the bets are coming in on that Colts spread. I think that chances are the Colts are going to win this game. I sure hope they do. I'll be in attendance, so hope that we can get a good game. Hopefully the Blue can pull it off. But it's going to be interesting to see how Jonathan Taylor does. Does Parker Frazier continue to run the ball with Taylor? They did so well that first drive against the Eagles last week, right? They run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, go all the way down. And then they just kind of abandoned it almost. They just started going now with these passes, and then it's third and long, and then you got a punt. So I'd like to see them just pound the rock, just run it over and over with Jonathan Taylor, set up some good play action shots. You have to. He's, he's one of the best running backs, if not the best running back in the league. He was last year, at least. You have to give him the rock as much as you can if you want to win games. And that's what, like you said, we haven't seen much of in crunch time. How about this? Anytime touchdown, you parlay Jonathan Taylor and Najee Harris. That's plus 257. Not a bad little bet there if you think those both not are going to score. All. Not at all. Najee is a power back. He's fun to watch. JT scored a touchdown easily. Goal line snaps. We'll see. I'll take the indie spread, though. I'll take the spread. I'll parlay it with a uh, Taylor touchdown and the over. That's plus 309. You bet 10. You win 30, almost 31. Seems like a good pick to me. Not bad. Hopefully the Colts can get that win tonight. Let's move on and talk about World Cup. How about that? The uh, USA team, they draw against England, which is a win in my book. England, one of the better teams out there. Draw nil-nil. Then you got a game against Iran tomorrow. If they win, man, they move on. Well, and the Iran squad is reeling because a few of their players got arrested by the Iranian national government uh, for not singing their uh, national anthem during the game. So I will say if the U.S. didn't have a chance before, they definitely have more than a chance now. The U.S., I mean, you, you draw your first two games, so it's not like you're coming and getting these big wins. But honestly, man, if they can just survive, the further they go, this is a young team, maybe they can screw around and end up getting a few wins. They could. They could. Now they've got to tie up some loose ends. They've got to play better defense. They've got to make sure they eliminate all the shots on goal that they've allowed in previous contests. And they've got to outshoot the other team. They've got to put points on the board. It's the only way to do it. That's it for Last Call. Nathaniel Finch, Jake Key for a great show today. Thank you for tuning in next Monday. Same time, Last Call.